So I'm going to talk about um, infinite Boltzmann planar maps. And what are those? Those are infinite planar maps with, in principle, arbitrary uh, phase degrees. And I'll assign different weights uh, to different uh, uh, to phases of different degrees. And um, peeling, what is that? Well, I'm going to describe the peeling process, which is a systematic way of exploring such planar maps. And this has turned out to be a uh, quite a useful tool to study various geometric properties of planar maps. So I'll start with some motivations. I give two different motivations. The first one is uh, quite uh, down to earth, also given kind of the, the broad audience here. Um, so this is a forest. And suppose I want to um, detect forest fires uh, early, as soon as possible. So I um, install a lot of sensors, and they have uh, smoke detectors or something. And they want to communicate uh, <coughs> with some central server. Now, typically, these sensors, I mean, this, this is used in real life, and it's being studied. Um, so these sensors, they have to communicate. And typically, they're equipped with uh, radio antennas but they have a limited range. So they have to actually communicate through the network of uh, sensors. And this puts quite a challenge on designing protocols for by engineers and software designers. Um, and they need to understand what, what you can do in these networks and what properties they uh, satisfy. So let's just let me give an naive example of the problems they face. So, here is a fire, so this sensor wants to communicate with the server, but a priori it doesn't really know where in the network it is. And we want to do this in an efficient way. So let's just do the uh, naive thing. It communicates its message to all its neighbors, and its neighbors replicate the message until at some point it ends up with the server. But since this, since this is real life, uh, there will be delays in this communication. So, and a good model for these delays is them taking to be random because they're influenced by environmental factors, technical factors. Um, so let's just take these delays to be uh, independent and identically distributed random uh, variables. And then via this process, by, via some route, this message will end up at the server. And well, clearly, this is not the most efficient way of doing things because it basically involves all sensors with their small batteries to, to replicate messages and work hard to get the message somewhere. So perhaps the server wants to know what the most efficient route was. For instance, this one, which is the, the shortest path for the network. Um, so based on what information might it get kind of an approximation of this? Well, suppose it only knows the time it took for a message to go there and the number of nodes that the message went through. Wouldn't it be nice if based on the, these two informations, it could actually get a rough idea of what the graph distance was? So if a rule of thumb of this kind of sort would be quite uh, useful. So here I normalize the uh, passage time by the, um, the, the average time it takes to, to send a message between two nodes. And actually, when you look at a lot of uh, models of random graphs, especially kind of planar ones, this actually gives a fairly good approximation. Uh, maybe it's a good rule of thumb. Now, I do not un understand why this is a good rule of thumb. Um, but something I do understand is a particular class of random networks where one can actually uh, go and see whether this is true. And these are the networks which are dual to Boltzmann planar maps. So here, the, the, the orange um, pair uh, graph is dual to the uh, this gray graph, which is a planar map, and I'll take it to be a Boltzmann planar map. Now, in addition, I will actually look at uh, graph distances, and I want to understand the ratios of these distances when I take the vertices very far apart. Now, I'm gonna, not going to prove any <coughs> convergence of the ratios. Could you talk about this t? So t is a, past, is a time it took for a message to go from here to there. Um, so in this particular random. case, I will take the, 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 the random delays in the dual graph to be 
exponential random variables. But in principle, one can look at any uh, identically distributed. That doesn't make any sense to put both loops. Well, in real life, networks. <laughs> Maybe, yes, I don't know. One can think of very many real life networks in which they do make sense. Okay, um, so that's the first uh, motivation. Now, people might remind me that I'm actually a physicist, and as a physicist, one should be interested in universal behavior. So one takes the lattice space and becomes small, and one just looks at continuum limit, and one expects that uh, the details of the continuum limit should not depend on exactly how I take the the decimal building blocks to be, or how I uh, define these lengths exactly at the microscopic level. And indeed, for a large class of um, Boltzmann player maps and various distances, one expects that in a scaling limit, they all converge to some uh, universal object, say the Brownian map or its, its uh, infinite uh, counterpart. And these geodesics, they, we expect them to converge just to one single geodesic. So then after rescaling, we're just computing the same thing again and again. Now this is not quite true. So in this class of uh, Boltzmann player maps, there are also non-generic scaling limits. And these are basically scaling limits where phases can become very large. And then you might end up in what is known as stable maps introduced by Jean-François Legal and Vermont. And they're basically characterized by random surfaces with holes in them, macroscopic holes. And those holes, they come from faces which actually become macroscopic and scaling them. So in these maps, there is actually no reason why various uh, geodesic distances should be the same. They might actually scale differently. And this makes sense, because if you can go through the dual graph, then you can actually take shortcuts for these large uh, faces. Now, is this uh, physical in any way? But well, it was uh, soon realized that actually they're related to all n models. So I have surfaces with random loops on them. And if I remove all interiors of loops, then I actually get something which is the stable map. And all n models are known to, to describe a rich uh, universality class, basically describing almost all 2D gravity uh, universality classes. And an uh, important open question is, how do uh, distances behave in such uh, geometries? OK, so let me get started. So here is uh, an outline. Um, I'll first introduce the Boltzmann player maps and the peeling process that I'll use. Then uh, important. Uh, Aspects of those are parameter and volume process. And I'll show that for general weight sequences, they can be described as bias random walks. And this uh, naturally extends to infinite planar maps. And the simplicity actually allows one to take scaling limits uh, in general. OK, so that's the first part of the talk. Second part of the talk, I will apply this machinery to um, study these various distances. So first passage time, pop count, dual graph distance. Uh, the graph distance is actually not that simple in the general case. So I actually borrow some results by Neumann. And putting these all together and assuming asymptotic linear scaling, one can conjecture uh, exact formulas for these ratios. And then I'll do a short example to show, to show how simple these formulas actually are, if, I, if time permits. So let me start with short history. So peeling, to my knowledge, was first studied by uh, Wakabiki in the early 90s uh, in the quest to understand the geometry of uh, random surfaces. And the basic uh, picture one should have in mind is a, uh, well, a weird shaped uh, potato. And one wants to peel this potato starting at one vertex, one point on this potato, until you reach the last point. And basically, the number of times you go around says something about how far these vertices are apart. Now, soon after, this peeling process led to the first an explicit formula for the two-point function of random triangulations by uh, Ambiar and Wakabiki. 
And as a side remark, these two-point functions often regarded just as an approximate heuristic derivation. Um, but in fact, only recently we realized that it gives their formulas in this old paper in 95 are exact formulas for the first passage two-point function on random triangulations. Now in mathematical literature, it was first formalized by Omar and Gell for the uniform infinite plane triangulations, which we uh, heard about in the previous talk. <coughs> and soon after, it was used to study various properties of triangulations, triangulations. So not only distances, but also perturbations, random walks, and even more. Now, quite recently, uh, Nicolas Curien and Jean-François Legal, they have derived precise scaling limits for a premature volume in this um, exploration process as a function of various uh, parameters, including various distances. <coughs> now, this talk will mainly be about extending their results to the infinite Boltzmann plane map and seeing what one can do with them. So the Boltzmann planar map, um, we've seen planar map before, so this is a rooted planar map, it has a root, and I call the, the, the face to the left of the root, the root face, and typically I'll draw that on the outside. And um, I take a weight sequence, so a weight sequence of non-negative real numbers, and one of them has to be uh, positive uh, beyond the first two, to be non-degenerate, and then we can assign a weight to any um, uh, rooted planar map by assigning q4 to every uh, square, uh, q5 to every uh, degree 5 phase, etc., except the root phase. And one adds up these weights for all possible rooted planar maps, and that gives me a disk function, which I do not know what it is. Now I'll also use a pointer disk function which has a marked vertex but otherwise it uh, counts the same object. And it can happen, of course, because this is an infinite sum, that actually the sum is infinite, but we call it uh, the weight sequence Q admissible exactly when it's finite. And in that case, the, um, these, the, these uh, terms divided by the disk function, they define a probability measure on the space of planar maps. And I call this the uh, Boltzmann planar map associated to this weight sequence Q. Now this includes triangulations, triangulations, and a lot of your favorite planar maps. Um, but it's kind of a unified uh, uh, description. Now a very nice uh, property of this disk function for the Boltzmann planar maps is that it has a very simple form. So there are two constants, C plus and C minus, uh, which depend on Q. And then all possible uh, disk functions of various uh, um, root phase degree L, so I, I think I mentioned that, they are encoded in this simple generating function. So if I know these numbers, I know the whole disk function. So this will simplify things very much in the repeating process. Um, so this is basically what I said. And, um, Typically, only the ratio of these two will be important, and I have to know that by R. There are two cases. Um, if the Q's, all of Q's are zero, then the resulting planar map will always be by part height. And in that case, R is always equal to one. And otherwise, we say it's non by part height, and R will be strictly um, three minus one. Okay, so the peeling process, or the lazy peeling process in particular, um, it's a way of exploring the planar map. So I take a pointed uh, planar map, and the root face I've drawn on the outside, and I've colored the contour of the root face. So one should uh, view this red curve as a closed curve. And I'll call the outside of this curve the explored map, the inside the unexplored map, and the red curve is the frontier. And I want to gradually move this frontier more. So how do I do this? Well, by any preferred algorithm. I choose one of the edges in the frontier. And I look what's on the other side of that edge. Now, if there is a new phase, I just add it to the explored map and uh, extend the frontier accordingly. 
if my uh, peel edge uh, is actually adjacent on both sides to the explorer region, I just remove it from the frontier and I keep either side. Uh, so this is a trivial <laughs> example, so let me fast forward a bit. So here is a situation where I want to explore this edge. Um, and it's taken on both sides to the explored region, so I have to see on what side the marked vertex is, and I only keep that side of my frontier. Now I continue this process until I end up uh, only with the marked vertex. And this happens after I've found a number of steps. Now we can ask for a uh, picture of a random player map, so the Boltzmann player map. What is the law of this parameter? So the perimeter is the length of the frontier after a certain number of steps. And for this particular peeling process, I've plotted it here. Um, and it's actually not hard to see that, that it's a Markov process. And this is really a consequence of the Markov process of planar maps that uh, Asaf already mentioned in previous talk. So basically, if we've explored up to a certain point, and we want to explore further, we view the, the unexplored region as unknown. And one should, I mean, in this lazy peeling process, basically the, why I call it lazy, one actually does not know that these edges are adjacent to itself. So in fact, the, the our current situation is this. And then one can ask about what, what player maps can sit inside of this unexplored region. But that is again a Boltzmann player map, but with a root phase degree, which is the length of the frontier. So any such map can occur, and since these are rotationally invariant, it does not actually matter which edge I try to peel, the distribution will always be the same. And therefore I get that the perimeter process is uh, a Markov process, and it's independent of how I choose where to peel. What? Okay, so let's uh, do it like this. <laughs> um, no, okay, so I use this for the basic pointer, I think, and then I use my right hand to tap. So it's not so hard to actually derive the, the law of this perimeter process. Um, it follows directly from the loop equations for pointed disk functions. So they satisfy. Uh, this loop equation, which basically says, tells me what is on the other side of the uh, peel edge. So either I have a new phase of a certain degree k, or I uh, prune the frontier and I have an unmarked disk on one side and a marked disk on the other side. So from here, one can uh, directly extract the, the change in the perimeter, and the positive jumps, or the Practically positive jumps are given by in terms of the weights, and the negative jumps are given in terms of the disk functions, the unmarked disk functions. And there is a reweighting here. Now, if one looks at the uh, large L limit of this, it determines a random walk which is independent of the position, so it's an ordinary random walk. And again, it's expressed in terms of the, the weights and the disk function. So suppose I just look at this random walk, it starts somewhere, say at 20. I think this is for a pentangulation. Then there are negative jumps, so it actually might jump to some negative integer. So this is not what we want, because the, the peeling of the point of uh, player map has to end at zero, maybe when it uh, has found the marked vertex. So what if we just uh, condition this to happen? So I condition this random walk to hit zero before it hits the negative integers, 
And when it hits zero, it just stays zero. Now, such a conditioning is uh, well known, and it can be achieved by a dupe transform by a function h, uh, which is just a rescaling of the pointed disk function. And indeed, if you look at these probabilities, we can just rewrite them in terms of this random walk by a reweighting by this uh, function h. So this function h only depends on r. Now, what do we know about this random walk, so the unconditioned one? Given the fact that Q is admissible, well, first of all, we know that it cannot actually drift to infinity, meaning that probability, when it starts above zero, that it always stays above zero, should be zero, because otherwise, we would have a finite probability of planar maps to be infinite, and that would make this function infinite. And another property follows directly from the fact in this expression for a probability that is sum to 1, that's equivalent to uh, h being harmonic, <laughs> or new harmonic, we call this, on the positive integers. So this equation has to be satisfied. So these are necessary conditions on this random walk. It turns out these are also sufficient conditions. So there is a bijection between uh, weight sequences q and random walks with certain jump probabilities in U, um, such that admissible uh, weight sequences are paired <coughs> with random walks for which H0 is new harmonic on positive integers and the random walk does not drift in it. Now this can be checked explicitly using the Hermann's explicit criteria for uh, admissibility. And one can continue by looking at uh, criticality. So criticality is a condition that is on the border of being admissible. And we need critical sequences in order to look at the large planar maps. Um, and one can already guess basically what it should be. So there the random walks should, in addition, not drift in minus infinity. So in mathematical terms, these random walks should oscillate. Now, here I've also uh, written the explicit expression for h, h r zero. And we can see it has a simple um, definition in terms of this generated function. And it only depends on r. So this is just one number between minus one and one. Now these conditions are actually equivalent to a different combination in terms of this mu, now involving h r one which is just a slight variation of this function, h of zero. And the critical ones, they correspond to this uh, being equality. And we can simplify this further by noticing that uh, these things together, I mean, they're simply related, these two. If this one is harmonic and this is satisfied, then it's equivalent to h1 being harmonic. So now we can forget about any other criteria for admissibility. <coughs> if we're interested in general peeling processes of general um, Boltzmann planar maps, the only thing we need is to find a random walk such that hr1 is uh, harmonic for some number r. So let's see where that gets us. But before I do that, um, let's go to infinite Boltzmann planar maps. So already in the SAFS talk, <coughs> we mentioned the local limit. So a local limit basically says that two planar maps are close in this topology if they have identical balls of large radius. And the larger the identical rate, the identical balls are, the, the closer they are in this topology. So in this topology, one can talk about convergence. And uh, quite recently, for general critical weight sequences, Robin Stevenson showed that um, rooted Boltzmann planar maps, which are conditioned to have n vertices, converge as you take this number of vertices to infinity to some well defined limit. And this limit we call the infinite Boltzmann planar map. And it's not hard to see that the appealing process instead extends naturally to such a uh, setting. 
So instead of taking this marked vertex as the point to which you, you peel, you now use the infinite component. So we can still discover faces and uh, prune the frontier and choose the infinite component to keep. We'll see examples in a second. And we have an obvious candidate of what the perimeter process of this should be because remember that uh, we have a harmonic function hr1 here so we can actually use it to do a loop transform to condition this random walk and since hr1 actually vanishes at zero it's conditioning it to stay positive and that is exactly what we need for the uh, infinite Boltzmann player map so indeed one gets the perimeter process of this infinite player map by just conditioning the <coughs> perimeter process to stay positive and one can write it as a loop transform with respect to h1 of this unconditioned random wall. So H1 being harmonic, what does this tell us about this random wall? Well, it's not hard to see that the negative jump probabilities are completely determined in terms of the positive ones. So I can just choose whatever positive jump probabilities I like, and it will tell me what the negative probabilities what is the h used to condition to stay positive? What is it? It's this <coughs> explicit expression here. Um, what? These are these are just numbers for any L. Or they're actually polynomials in R, but if I fix R. It grows like a uh, square root of L. So so you use H K for H K? K K one. Yeah, K is one. So we'll encounter an H2, so this is in general form. But yes, we're, we're now interested in the H1. Um, so in particular, this, this linear map re uh, <coughs> relates the negative tails to the positive tails, supposing that I actually take a uh, positive tail. So it says, uh, in particular, since this thing grows as a square root of k, then it has to fall off like k to the minus three and a half, please. And we can distinguish various cases here. So there is a heavy tailed case where it falls off between three and a half and five and a half. So I write it this way. And this is exactly what um, Jean Francois Legal and Niamon have studied in the uh, scaling limit of uh, planar maps of large spaces leading to the stable maps. And there is a non-heavy tailed case, which is characterized by uh, taking this H2, which now grows like yeah, k to the three halves. So whenever this is finite, then I can, in general, determine the negative tail, and it will always fall off by k to the minus five half, and the prefactor is given in terms of this constant. Now, usually it's actually more practical to, to, to look at regular critical sequences where they actually fall off at least uh, exponentially. But this is for technical reasons. And it includes all the familiar examples of triangulations uniformly in the pegger maps. Okay, so the scaling limits follow from this. Um, the scaling limit of the uh, random walk uh, follows from the fact that you know the tails and the fact that it does not drift that it uh, converges to a three and a half stable process with negative jumps and then borrow an argument from Julian and Miguel based on an invariance principle by these people it follows immediately that the perimeter process which is the conditioned version of this converges to a conditioned uh, stable process now I can also look at the number of vertices that you've explored after a certain number of steps. And here is just a direct generalization of the Kilian and Gauss theorem um, to a particular well-known uh, stochastic process for these two. So one has to renormalize the, the parameter by uh, certain powers of n, which are the same for all regular critical. 
Okay, so let me get to the second part of the talk where I'm going to apply this to study these distances. So this will definitely be less rigorous. Um, but I want to show you some explicit formulas and how one can in principle go about uh, getting uh, exact results. So let me look at first passive percolation. So as I said, we'll look at the uh, dual graph and put exponential weights on these edges. And then, or, or let's give them an exponential length. And we can view this dual graph as just a metric space and look at balls in this metric space. So for increasing radius, so the green ones are the balls. Sometimes I discover a new vertex. Sometimes I encounter myself. And I can go on and go on. And if one looks at the uh, dual pair map, there's a nice associated peeling process where whenever I discover a vertex, I discover a face. And whenever I encounter myself, I'm actually uh, proving this from here. And it's not hard to see that this peeling process is actually uh, obtained by an algorithm where you just choose your next peeling edge uniformly from the front here. This is a consequence of the exponential distribution being memoryless. Okay, so one can continue. Um, one can ask, what is the, the associate passage time at which this step would have occurred? And it's simple to write down the law of this passage time once one knows what the parameter is. It's just, just given by a sum of uh, exponential random variables, um, rescaled by the uh, parameter at each step, because we have uh, the parameter number of competing exponential random variables. And the minimum of those is exactly distributed as an exponential random variable uh, rescaled by one over its length. And we can also look at the whole count. So the whole count is basically the shortest path to some very far away vertex. And one can ask um, how many edges of this shortest path have I explored up to a certain time. And given the Markov process of planar maps and the fact that this peeling process is a uniform one, it's not hard to see that the probability that a certain step I explore one more of these edges okay, so a color is missing is proportional to the number of outgoing edges of a new phase that I've explored so this, this path could as well have been uh, going through one of these other edges so I just take the number of these edges divided by the length of the frontier and that gives me the probability that it increases. And therefore, this hop count is just a sum of Bernoulli random variables with a simple law in terms of the uh, perimeter. And in fact, this trickle is a Markov process. And it's not hard to see how the expected increase is um, after, say, a single step. So let me assume that we're in a situation where the perimeter is large then <coughs> because of the driftlessness of the, um, the random walk, the parameter will hardly change, but the hop count will uh, increase with a probability equal to this if one works out in terms of the explicit law we had. It leads to the um, relation, so to the expected increase in the passage time is just one over L. So the, pre the, the, the factor in between is this simple uh, function in terms of the uh, positive weight. And let me call that uh, constant h. And if indeed these hop count at passage time scale linearly for our date times, then this must be exactly their ratio. Okay, so now let me look at a different peeling process, which is a deterministic peeling process. Since I um, choose to explore first both sides of the root space, and then in uh, counterclockwise order, I explore all phases <coughs> adjacent to these uh, distance one phases, do like this, and I continue this process, and I will discover my player map layer by layer. And let me write vi to be the average distance from edges in the frontier 
through the dual graph to the, um, the, the root phase. Now it's not hard to see that at every step in this peeling process, the frontier is of this form, so I have a number of edges adjacent to d plus one phases, number of edges adjacent to d phases, so where d is now the, the floor of uh, uh, this average distance. <laughs> Now, trivially, I can rewrite this, this average distance in terms of the number of edges at d plus 1 minus the number of edges at d, and just see how this changes when I do a step. So again, I'm going to assume now that, that these are both quite large and work at leading order. So either I discover a new phase, or I uh, notice that it's actually adjacent to some other phase. And this can go in both directions. The thing we should notice is that whether I swallow a number of edges to the left or to the right, that occurs with equal probability. So the difference between the number of edges swallowed on this side and on that side actually cancels in these two situations. Of course, I'm always removing the peel edge, so that gives me a factor A1. I'm also removing the peel edge when I discover a new phase. But in addition, if I discover a new phase, I'm adding a number of edges to the d plus 1 uh, part. So that's again the same uh, quantity I had in the previous slide. And notice that this 1 over L was the expected increase in the passage time uh, with respect to a different peak. But if I again assume these to scale linearly asymptotically, then the only option is for, for the, the passage time in the graph distance to scale linearly, the increase should really be just this factor here. So it follows from this argument that if they scale linearly, then this formula, the simple formula, should be satisfied for any regular critical walls <coughs> And it seems to be a consequence of the Markov property. It is still quite amazing. But the graph distance is not so simple. Um, it is quite simple for triangulations. Um, and indeed, uh, Jean-François Legard and Guillain have uh, derived the scaling limits, including for well, peeling with respect to this graph distance. Um, but for general planar maps, if one tries to peel according to the graph distance, there will always be a non-trivial uh, graph distance on the, the frontier. And it's hard to keep track of it. So let me just steal some uh, information from one of uh, Miamon's papers, where he derived the scaling limit of uh, the two-point function on finite Boltzmann player map. So when he just takes two random vertices in a finite Boltzmann player map and asks, uh, when I take this Boltzmann planar map to be large, how does this scale? And it always scales towards a, a universal random variable once rescaled by a certain constant C of Q. Yes. So, he outlined an algorithm to compute this. Um, so I spent some hard work and some sweat on uh, actually performing this algorithm. And it actually leads to quite a simple formula. And comparing these to the various scaling constants one has for the other distances, one can make a precise conjecture for the, um, the ratios of these distances. So the graph distance to uh, passage time is this simple formula. Graph distance to dual graph distance to passage time we already saw. And we can also com distill from here the ratio of the graph distance to dual graph distance. And it seems, or I've heard rumors, that for triangulations, uh, some of these ratios have indeed been proven to uh, converge in probability when uh, the distance becomes large. But uh, I'm not speculating much on this. So a quick example uh, to show that these formats are quite simple. Let's look at uniform infinite planar maps. So these are planar maps that are obtained from a local limit. By, by taking a random graph when only fixing the number of vertices and number of faces. 
So this is an interesting Boltzmann planar map because the dual map is also a Boltzmann planar map. In fact, these are the only Boltzmann planar maps that satisfy this property. <coughs> and the weight sequence one has to choose for this has to be a geometric weight sequence. Um, and based on the relation between this and the, the random walks, necessarily the random walks, the, the, the positive jump probability that has to be need to be geometric. So we can just put in an ansatz and just require that H1 is the more harmonic and it will tell you everything <coughs> you want to know. So let me just plug in the numbers. So this gives me alpha in terms of sigma. The next equation gives me uh, R in terms of sigma. And then the third equation tells me jump probability of minus 2 in terms of sigma, but that gives me C plus. So then I need, I have all, all I need to know to compute the various constants. So the H constant can be expressed in terms of sigma, this L constant, and in particular you get the various ratios of graph distances. And here one can see the, 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 the duality taking uh, the dual. Um, since if I take the dual of a player map, then better the ratio of the dual graph distance and the graph distance would go to its inverse. And indeed, taking uh, h minus 1 over 2 to its inverse is going to the dual map. So that's just a small back of the envelope calculation. We can do similar things for any other preferred player map, triangulations, triangulations, get explicit numbers. Okay, so let me go to some um, problems which one might, might work on. Um, so first of all, can one derive this um, scaling <coughs> constant from a peeling process? I do not know yet how to do this, but it must be possible in some way. So this is surprisingly simple relation, which approximately seems to be valid for a large, much larger class of graphs even. Where does this come from? Is it a result of some approximate mark of property. Um, okay, one could look at um, fluctuations in between these distances and uh, on the uh, lattice one expects a universality class there, um, but with the cases on a random graph nobody has any clue, I guess. And, but an interesting thing is to look at uh, heavy-tailed um, random walks, which I have not included in the second part of this talk. But we can still study distances with respect to these, and it's known that with respect to graph distance, it scales to these stable maps, which have a non-trivial uh, Hausdorff dimension. How about uh, with respect to other distances? They will be quite different, these limiting objects. And uh, closely related ON models can also be described by an aspirin process in this condition, but I won't go into this. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. We lost a bit of time due to the technical problems. We have time for a couple of questions. Sorry. So, in the case of the uh, infinite, uh, the random infinite penamat, so it's one imagine. If I'm not mistaken, it's self-dual. If you take the dual, it has the same distribution. Well, yeah, it's, it's self-dual for this particular value. Oh. So that's when I only fix a number of vertices. <coughs> I'm fixing both the number of vertices and phase. OK, so this can be OK. And then you find, of course, to the same. OK. Mm. Yeah. Oh. And the same, of course, holds for the ratio of the number of vertices and phases. 